trying to explain what the Monogatari series is and what wants to be is the most difficult question I've ever tried to answer. Because there are infinite ways to sum up its dance and confusionary plot, infinite ways to describe its iconic characters and their goofy interactions, but there are also infinite ways to convey a wrong idea of what all this is really about. I could say that the focus are the strange and surreal adventures of Araragi Koyomi and his friends with ghosts, spirits and other folkloristic absurdities, but while leaving a vague idea of the contest, once the first episode starts, it becomes only the surface of a deep ocean of symbolism, double meanings and dreamlike atmospheres. Sensation that you can really express perfectly with words, neither do you expect them in a show so full of prolix dialogues, dead jokes and fan service that you can squeeze all of that crap out and use it as a toothpaste. Watching the Monogatari series for the first time is like eating your first marshmallow when you were little. It has a strange consistency, but after all, tastes better than the dirt in your garden. The plot is unnecessarily complex, but it's consistent. The characters are bizarre, but very consistent. The soundtrack can be alienating sometimes, but it's the most consistent element of all. And even if I don't know shit, for sure has a strange direction that made me fall in love with those empty monochrome screens, so probably it must have done something good and consistent. And it's that surprise that realization, that wonder and even that disappointment, the true heart of the series, and I love it for that. It shows situations, characters and discussions so trivial only to subvert them with environments, soundtracks and a direction so organic that even the little details tell their part of the story. And when you finish its almost 80 episodes, you can read everything in so many ways that it becomes nearly impossible to understand what is true to what is false anymore. In fact, you can say that the Monogatari series is the greatest lie written by the biggest liar Earth has ever seen. After all, words are intrinsically deceitful because they can express only part of what we want to convey, and really, we couldn't have expected better from the animation of a story created to be impossible to animate. So if I wanted to describe the Monogatari series trying to lie as little as possible, knowing that a picture is worth a thousand words, then this is how I will describe it. I can all imagine the sheer fear of watching the Monogatari series today for the first time. It was 2011 when I stumbled across Baki Monogatari, an anime with 12 episodes plus 3 called Extras, with a premise so banal that almost intrigued me the idea of watching a strange Chinese clone of Twilight on harem sauce. But now, in 2019, no matter how cliched is my sound, things are more complex than they once were. Write Monogatari on Google and with the obvious mal and wiki, you will be assaulted by two words that nobody should ever read, words like timeline and watch guide, description that can attract those interested in a universe to master and understand, but also very bad business cards for those who only want to see what pathetic excuses the writer will use to make each girl suck the protagonist to cock. But even if you are brave enough to overcome this obstacle, you won't find the small and sinister looking grove you'll love to explore with your friends when you went to your grandma's house, but the damned Amazon forest, with explanations, graphs and diagrams that, however simple and made with heart, looks more like a commitment than entertainment, a feeling amplified by the existence of a condensed version for a guide that shouldn't have existed in the first place. The problem here are the titles that simply aren't friendly. I can understand that the second season is well, the second season, but how I am supposed to know what comes first and what after if each title is different from the other? Like, is Nise Monogatari the sequel or the prequel of Hana Monogatari? And what even is Koyomi Monogatari? A nonsense extra? And so, can I skip it? And why everyone tells me to watch Kids Monogatari last, even if it's the first, chronologically speaking? <laughs> And this is not the end, because if you then give up and whisper to yourself hey, sooner or later I will be able to watch all this stuff since the story is now finally over, you will be delighted to discover that not only the epilogue will come out this year, but also that it's just a matter of time before Shaft will release even the so-called Monster Season and Off Season, series of light novels that continue the conclusion marked by the next Zoku Arimonogatari to further expand the secondary cast. And so, even though they are technically spin-offs, they are still really important to understand the whole series, 
since the characters like in Metal Gear Solid are all in the Monogatari series. And not by chance according to Kojima's works, because these two titans have a lot to share. Both have simple plots with complex timelines and simple characters with complex motivation, but Metal Gear Solid is a video game. You can skip every other game and play directly the Phantom Pain without paying attention to the story and still enjoy one of the best stealth video games ever created. Yes, you can do that if you are a masochist or the Haggets at Konami completely lost their mind. And the only way to experience the entire Metal Gear saga is to play it on some damn pachinko machine. But I digress. In reverse, you can't play the Monogatari series. You can't skip the cutscenes because the cutscenes are the Monogatari series. So in one hand, we have a series that isn't easy to approach, with brilliant and simple titles but not so brilliant in their simplicity. And on the other hand, we have a tangled timeline that doesn't make things easier. In fact, it's really easy why all of these mixed together should end up making a hell of a series to watch. Instead, the Monogatari series remains highly enjoyable and entertaining even if you understand only a third of what's happening on the screen. Because the beginning of a Monogatari is how a good premise should always be interesting and fun. Its job is to make you think about something, bringing up a question, a discussion or a fact with strong and charismatic characters. A good premise must kidnap you, leaving only a what will happen next in your mind and the first 10% of every monogatari does exactly that. But is the next 70% the problem? I like to call this part the quicksand. <laughs> because it's here where the majority of people stop watching or loses interest. And there's no way I can blame them, after all the characters jump from stupid chit chat to the important parts with such a speed that, when those characters stop talking, forgetting the initial topic of discussion is right on the list of things to do, next to laundry and continue to not give a single fuck about politics. Because dialogues in the Monogatari series are exactly like your girlfriend. They're beautiful, nice and charismatic, but they would still be like that even without commenting on every single little shit as well as actually giving you a good reason to cancel that unexpected flight to Mexico City. But once you overcome this swamp that seems to never end, all this bullshit are swept away by a final climax that always leaves you baffled and, sometimes, even causing some manly tears to appear. But again, just like your girlfriend, the anime doesn't forget about anything that has told you in the last 100 years of relationship, and leaves you with a mixture of confusion and excitement with an explanation that you will never understand, adding only a K as a reply to your excuses that leaves you on the edge of your seat filled with anger but at the same time strangely curious to find out what will happen next. And this vicious cycle of curiosity, confusion, redemption and hype pushes you to watch the next episode and then the next again because it's a character driven show, not plot driven. Understanding the plot is not essential to enjoy the anime if you have characters so relatable and interesting that speak in such a bizarre and unique way that, in the end, all you want is simply to see them continue talking to each other. And this bizarre and unique way is not only used to write down the dialogues, but also to tell the stories in which these dialogues are found. So, if in order to understand all of Metal Gear Solid is necessary to understand the artistic, personal and professional background of its author, in this case the Hideo Kojima of the Monogatari series takes the name of Nizio Izin, a man and a palindrome obsessed with the idea of mystery. Mystery that, for those who don't know Japanese, doesn't characterize only his stories but also his whole being. Because if in the West he's only an unknown writer of kids' stories, in Japan Nizio Izin is a very successful author, something like an Asian Stephen King, who, with his timeless stories like the spin off of the claimed Death Note, another note, the Los Angeles BB murder cases, is considered one of those new writers able to break down the wall between light novels novels and real novels. But Nizio Izin also succeeded in finding its own space in the Japanese publishing field, becoming an icon of the mystery genre with Hiroshimori, the author of alienating first winner of the Mephisto Prize Subite Gaif Ninaru, and Koei Kadono, the writer of that hallucinatory journey known as Boogie Pop. The trick used to distinguish himself from that hellish and saturated blob that is the Japanese light novel market is very simple actually. He writes dialogue as they were Masai performances, a traditional form of Japanese cabaret in which a stiff and severe person and a silly and naive one, called respectively Tsukomi and Boku, improvise gags based on puns, misunderstanding and Quelambour. or in other words, he transforms the complexity but flexibility of the Japanese language into something playful and curious, often quoting manga and anime he loves like the bizarre 
adventures of Jojo, weaving together classic shonen and shoujo elements in stories that always have irreverent and sarcastic shades, right next to introspective and philosophical ones. It's simply such a peculiar and interesting style, but also so easy to think and put into practice, that many other authors have begun to take inspiration and use it themselves, like Itomi Ruma, the author of Denpa Onna to Seishun Otoko. And all of these elements mixed together create such a special and unique style that can be seen in all of Nizui's countless creation, adaptation and animation included, from its titanic and fascinating journey to write a book a month for a year, Katanagatari, to his boldly colorful parody of the shonen Medaka Box, but also in his most recent interpretation of the battle royale genre in Junitans and Zodic War. Not to mention the myriad of small projects, some translated and carried in the West, like the light novel XXX Holic and Other Holic, and some manga like Ogiri and Shonen Shoujo, and many others still trapped behind the Japanese language barrier, like the detective story of Kitegami Kyoko no Biboroku or the Dio Brando's point of view of Phantom Blood in his long monologue over heaven. But for whoever find this wordplay entertaining and actually funny, there will be someone that find them boring and useless, especially if used so massively in a story that isn't a comedy but sometimes give the distinct feeling that wanting to make the audience laugh is more important than telling the actual story. Because if understanding the Monogatari series is the most difficult thing I ever tried to write, then the second on the list would certainly be explaining the genre where it belongs. It has a handful of wonderful, perfect choreographed action scenes, credible romance, intense drama, lots of laughs and even sheer slice of life moments, but nonetheless remain a harem, you know, the genre that shouldn't have existed, with lots of elements taken from the mystery genre. In fact, we have the classic hero of justice kind of protagonist that, for some reason, saves only girls came straight out that smelly and odd box named anime cliches, where the cool anime really loved to hang out, maybe because they recognize the smell or maybe because being similar to the other is the only way to find a reason to exist, just like myself taking serious stupid cartoons no one cares. Anyway, being the anime, anime girls they are, they end up falling in love with the protagonist and try to seduce him in some strange way. And yes, Nadeko, I'm looking at you, you are your stupid twisted bullshit. And just like any harem anime, most of the scenes are a mess of static characters with static conversation overflowing with jokes that become static too quickly, all shot in static location. Which is not really true, but... I'll get to this later. So, as much as I don't want to say it, the Monogatari series undoubtedly has a lot in common with any Zora Art Online or High School of the Dead, but act in a completely opposed way. The Monogatari series is based entirely on conversation that can last entire episodes, while the others try their best to grab your attention throwing reckless action scenes at the screen, hoping that smashing together two awkwardly looking souls and by bouncing some teeth around, you will magically forget how much the dialogues and the character are trivial and uninspired. In fact, if you think about it, when people talk about Zora Art Online or High School of the Dead, just mention the action scenes or the fan service and never the quality of the dialogues or the story, if not to discredit them. While for the Monogatari series, people certainly remember the dialogue and its jokes, but especially the characters who say those jokes. It almost seems like a deconstruction. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I bit my tongue. Um, I was saying, it seems like the Monogatari series wants to be the deconstruction of the arm. Okay. We all want to say that our favorite anime is the deconstruction of something else, because it makes even the stupidest anime look like something intellectual, interesting and smart. And we all want to look at something that makes us seem intellectual, interesting and smart. So no, I won't say that word, but instead I will say that the Monogatari series loves to ironize about its own genre. After all, the protagonist immediately chooses the girl he likes after 5 episodes. All the girls have credible reasons to fall in love with him, and after some time stop running after him, and some even change change their life. The events of the episode, their causes and their effects have concrete results that change both the world and the characters, and perhaps the most important element of all is the first RM anime I ever seen that ends, and it does so with an explosion that closes everything in the most satisfactory way possible. It's literally a harem paced with extremes, that takes everything the harem genre has, cuddle it for some episode and then BAM! Throw everything under the window, subverting those elements and giving them a depth that, given the genre they belongs to, makes the Monogatari series a appear as the best harem anime ever created, while what remains of those elements is pumped to astronomical level, filling each pawns with double meaning, and by making most of the edgy scenes so controversial that for many those may result in a reason not to watch the series. And given how popular this genre is in Japan and how easily it can be manipulated, I think that Nizio Izin could have become famous even without this famous gag. I mean, there's a whole narrative arc which is also the most loved by the fans, who comment just how the crazy love proclamated by the generic harem is stupid, childish and harmful 
shameful, and it does so screaming how money is better than anything else, and by showing the real consequences of that poisonous love. And this is not crazy, fun, ironic, and interesting. Yes, it is, but perhaps only for someone that watched RM anime since he knows the medium, and loves something genuinely strange, because on the other hand, it's very easy to understand why so many people run away disgusted by the works of this crazy Japanese writer. Because it's precisely when these puns, dead jokes and sexual allusion become too much, more or less already between the second and third narrative arc of Bakemonogatari, then the wonder of the surprise slowly fade away, and here is when the boredom and the irritation of harassing repetitiveness take over, because everything, plot and characters include follow a very precise pattern, a pattern that can become suffocating real fast. Because everything is a wordplay in the Monogatari series, the character's name are wordplay, the name of its author is a wordplay, and even the title of the story are wordplays. Because Bakemonogatari is a story about monsters, but not only. Because Koi Monogatari is a love story, but not really. And because Nise Monogatari is a story about lies, but also how to sexually harass your sisters. And simply, these buffooneries aren't for everyone. And I hate the sound of my voice when I have to say these sort of things. I don't want to make the Monogatari series look like one of those refined nouvelle cuisine deliciousness, because it is not. The Monogatari series is that greasy ass hamburger that's so fat but so good that even the bread is made of other hamburgers, and the salad and tomatoes ran away in disgust. It's that mountain soup that looks and smells suspiciously, but that's so full of colors and ingredients that at least manage to be curious. And it is also that unknown traditional dish you can only find in the worst part in the most hidden villages, which you know will make you vomit, but you continue on eating because it has an interesting taste. And that concludes all the food analogies I got. What I'm trying to say is that I completely understand why so many find the Monogatari series a bad anime, for the overwhelming presence of bullshit. After all, comedy is one, if not the most, subjective thing ever. But only the idea of thinking about the Monogatari series without those never-ending puns is... It's impossible, it would be like ripping out its soul. It will feel... wrong. And this must mean that all those jokes do something right. In fact, what distinguishes the Monogatari series gags from a generic RM ones is the active way in which they are used. These continuous jokes and references are repeated by the same characters until they become catchphrases, and with that, a real part of the character and most importantly, a way for us to really feel them. Hachikuji here is the perfect example. His relationship with Araragi is entirely based on mocking each other in the strangest and most embarrassing way possible. The fact that she constantly changed Araragi's name is iconic of her character and a classic of the whole series, as are the actions of Raragi when surprises her innocently wandering around the city. Moreover, people will not remember Muraragi's son, Shuraragi's son, or Araragi's son if they don't like those characters in some way. And when you notice that even the characters themselves embrace these jokes, repeating and quoting them ad nauseum, you won't be the only one to feel that there's something wrong when all of those stupidity will disappear. The world of Araragi will seem empty without Oshino's cheerful, did something good happen? Senjogara wouldn't be her without reminding Tuaradagi how superior she is in comparison with him, and Echo wouldn't be so disturbing without trying to seduce him with hundreds of tricks, and we couldn't understand his strange relationship with Hanekawa without his obsession for her huge breasts. Jokes, puns, and catchphrases also outline an author who simply loves and enjoys write and the writing process itself, and wants to communicate this passion through his characters, although the quality of the gags is very, very quiet. But after all, laughing because the joke is quality and obvious is not still appreciated in some way. But although puns are the Monogatari series gimmick, it's important to understand that they are not its focus. They characterize the story, they spice things up, but they aren't the story. Obviously, there are several occasions when the problem and resolution is linked to a wordplay that would be incomprehensible without the help of a specialist. But even if this was the whole series, then that wouldn't be that bad either. Because Nizio Izin is a master when it comes into flipping cliches such as zombies, time travels, or vampires, and creates situations with unexpected results that, if not always exciting or touching, for sure leaves something to think about. He's able to write such good episodic kind of plots, but all linked in a single macro narrative, ranging from cringe to seriousness, from comedy to drama, and from light-hearted to emotional with a simplicity that only One Piece can successfully replicate. And I believe there are no doubts why the Achikuji narrative arc is one of the best in the whole series. Because at this point you're comfortable with the strange direction and with Senjogara, but from the third episode everything changed, and you find yourself in a part that seemed to flutter in the air with a couple of recurring characters and…
Here comes a new girl with a design and characterization completely different from the ones you've seen that immediately start joking with the protagonist in a completely different way compared to the ones you've already seen. And after spending most of the episode trying to solve her problem, and after discovering that she is not who you think she is, all of a sudden you will notice that the light-hearted tone of the previous episode has disappeared. And with this revelation comes a resolution and a conclusion that hits you straight into your emotional cords, leaving you amazed, surprised and satisfied with only the distinct feeling of having lived a three episodes lucid dream. Even now, although I have seen Bakamonogatari at least 20 times, I still feel that surreal speed because the characters never stop talking and the most important things happens all condensed at the end and this leaves you without breath only if you don't press the pause button. And if this makes the Monogatari series a crazy ride to the next narrative arc with many highs and many lows, it's important to remember what really is, a light novel adaptation, and light novels are 99% dialogues, so I think it was a very clever move not cutting too many lines in the animation, probably Shaft realized that would be impossible understanding everything from the first watch, so they decided to focus all the production on amplifying the immediacy of all Nizio Ising characters, leaving the true understanding to the next rewatch so you can forget all of the stupidity and instead focus on that dubious line that you didn't understand the first time. The Monogatari series is like Monster Hunter, or the original Destiny, The Division or Warframe, it's that kind of activity that you know what to do and how to do it, but it's also the activity you always find yourself returning to because every time it gives you something new, whether it's only some loot or a curious piece of lore. In the Monogatari series understanding the character and the plot is just the beginning, because the real meat, the end game, is understanding why those events happened and why those were the results, it's understanding why the character character acted with that particular action, and why they said that particular sentence. I simply find it a series created to be watched all in one breath, over and over again, and though it might sound paradoxical for an 80 episode series, this makes much sense if we take into account that Nizio Isin became a professional writer at 20 years old, winning the Mephisto Prize, a bizarre Japanese literary contest in which judges value entertainment and immediacy above everything else. What makes this contest so bizarre but so brilliant is that it's aimed at mystery fiction writer, in particular detective fiction since the actual prize is a representation of no other than Sherlock Holmes itself. And immediacy isn't really the first adjective that comes to mind when thinking about these kind of stories. Mystery fiction are synonymous with complexity, suspense, twists, and especially with a very slow plot development. As it is, my ability to get to the fucking point already. Generally, this kind of fiction remains boring until the mystery happens, and then return boring until the conclusion, where, if we are lucky enough to be in one of Chandler's hard-boiled masterpiece, we'll have a strong confrontation between a tough detective with a heart of gold and an unexpected culprit. Moreover, Sherlock Holmes, Philip Marlowe and Hercule Poirot are such famous characters that nowadays they are a part of our pop culture. But who remembers the others, excluding obvious antagonists like Professor Moriarty? Obviously, you can't tar everyone with the same brush, but what I'm trying to say is that uninteresting secondary character and boring developments are kind of parts of the mystery genre. And it's precisely for this reason why it's very complicated to create an investing detective video game that isn't a visual novel, because it's hard to make interactive and interesting moments such while in the plot they don't necessarily have to be, such as those where the protagonist examines the crime scene, talks with the suspects, or those where he's simply alone rethinking all he learned from a different perspective. But if you want to win the Mephisto Prize, you don't have to think that way. Taking part in this competition forces you to think in a completely different way, in a more interesting way. Because the question isn't how to write the perfect mystery, but how to write the most entertaining mystery. And this is a much more complicated task than the other, because it pushes you to be more creative with a genre so full that every mystery seems the same shit, only with some sugar on top of it. And Izio Izin's answer was writing the Kubikiri Cycle, a light novel so similar to Ten Little Indians by Agatha Christie, but much more entertaining, that it makes the latter looking like the recycled copy of the Kubikiri Cycle cycle only with some sugar on top of it, because this time R11 and Lucky will get stuck with a killer on an island without the chance to escape. But what separates these two works more than anything else is Nizio Izin's ability to write characters so unique, interesting and important that each of them could easily be the protagonist of his own story, a quality that can be recognized in all his creation, including the Monogatari series. In fact, this one has much in common with the Kubikiri cycle and consequentially with the Zaragoza series. Leaving aside scary length with live actions, drama CD and dozens of spin-offs, both works have characters built around a central idea. In fact, they can be summarized in few words. Araragi is the hero of justice, Anekawa the big titties with high glass class president would know everything, Senjugara the tsundere, Kambaru the perverter Genki, Nadeko the childhood friend, Achikuji the loli, Shinobu the loli vampire, Onanoki the loli… 
thing and so on. And it's this immediacy why you can walk away from the Monogatari series without the sensation that you know one of these characters, because they are clear references to all those stupid stereotypes we love in anime. But what makes them special and unforgettable is how they are explored, because Senjogara is certainly a tsundere, but it's when Nizio Isin tells you why and how she become the tsundere she is, that the character breaks the shell made by the cliché and become its own thing. And this never happens in a generic harem. In harems, the characters are stereotypes, but in a Monogatari series, Series, the stereotype is here only to identify the character in the short term. It's like using a fake bait in fishing. Only that, in our case, the fish baited is a casual viewer who doesn't know what to expect. But the Kubikiri cycle won the Mephisto Prize not only because it introduced the dozen characters full of personality, but also thanks to a mystery with a trivial premise but with an exceptional execution. Blocking these 11 small wandering minds and forcing them to wander around a small island was a brilliant move, because from bizarre characters comes bizarre discussion and bizarre outcomes. Comes. Also, it's like being with the protagonist during his investigations, trying to match alibis and clues in a mystery that appears simple, but turns out to be very complicated. And when I say very complicated, I mean enormously, crazily and impossibly complicated, at least impossibly complicated all in the last part. If you can understand who do it before the protagonist as in any good detective story, it's precisely in the impossibility to understand everything without the help of a character where it lays the common ground between the Kubikiri cycle crime and the Monogatari series mystery. Is. Because if Nizioism himself will move away from this pure detective story vein, already with the third book of the Zarigoto series, what he did with the Monogatari series was moving the core of his stories from discovering a murderer to unravel the mysteries hidden by Strange City and its strange inhabitants. And the result of this change is that the mysteries of the Monogatari series simply were not created to be solved by the audience. If the murder of the Kubikiri cycle was impossible to fully understand because that was a part of its theme, in the Monogatari series that impossibility became the foundation of its mysteries. In fact, there are characters precisely inserted in the plot to be human info dump, a character archetype that Nizuizin really loved to use in all his stories. And I know, technically this isn't a real problem, but every time a mystery is solved by the classic character who knows everything because well, because he knows everything, I cannot stop myself from feeling betrayed by the writer. The fun part of a mystery is being able to solve it before anyone else, because doing so always makes you feel smarter and clever than those eggheads in the story. And the fact that I can't solve it because, exactly like the characters, I don't have all the necessary information to understand it all, is only an easy trick to not think creatively and write a real mystery with a real and logic solution. But the problem, if it exists, is in the concept and narrative structure of the Monogatari series. Because unlike the Zargot series before Bakemonogatari Volume 1 and Volume 2, there were only Itagi Crab, Mayo Snail, Suruga Monkey, Nadeko Snake and Tsubasa Cat, five short stories linked by the same protagonist, setting and some recurrent character. They only should have been Monogatari, little stories, and not a true series. This can easily be seen not only by reading Bakemonogatari and Nizu Monogatari, but also Kizu Monogatari and Neko Monogatari Black, prequels written only to close all the plot holes created by Bakemonogatari. And I think is this the point when Nizio Isin must have taken so much pleasure writing those characters that he decided to make the Monogatari series such writing the second season, embracing a broader narrative with all these characters engaged in many small mysteries linked by a larger one than they ended with the following final season. Although years have passed between Zokumari Monogatari and Bakke Monogatari, Nizio Isin preserved that short story structure that characterized the series before it became such. And, if you think about it, this narrative structure is not really the best for trying to tell a Mr. Mystery without running into a dull repetition like Detective Conan or Law and Order. So on one hand we have a writer that loves mysteries, and on the other hand short stories written for pure passion that share the course of mystery fiction but can truly embrace it. And the meeting point was indeed the creation of the second season, because if in the first season Nizio Isin focused only on showing Araragi saving all the girls, in the second, as well as becoming more creative about what is really a mystery, he also shifted the focus of his mysteries. The mystery resolution became lesser important than the effect of that resolution on the characters, because Araragi of course saves Senjogara, Chikuji, Kanbaru, Nadeko and Anekawa, because he thinks it's the right thing to do, but... Is it really? The second season builds itself over this question, giving answers not so obvious to question that, instead, should be obvious. Literally, Nizio is in turn on itself the most boring part of mystery fiction, making it the most entertaining one. Again, I'm talking about rewatchability, because mystery fiction is the antithesis of rewatchability. Once you know the why, how and who of a mystery, there is no reason to rediscover it, because the satisfying part, aka the resolution, is already been wasted. But this does not apply to the Monogatari series. Saving Senjogara was obviously the right thing to do, in fact we see the result in few episodes. But we can say the same for Achikuji or Kambaru, which we'll don't know 
until the second season? And I think it's because of this lie, intrinsic game of wondering what will happen to that particular character after that particular event if Nizu isn't released the second season non chronologically. To create suspense and subvert it, making from time to time our favorite character the protagonist of a story with events that will permanently modify it, for better but also for worse. After all, for every Anekawa who finds herself, there is always an Adeko who loses herself. The most entertaining thing about this whole process is that it's based entirely on the fact that Araragi, as a good hero of justice as he is, always thought he was doing the right thing. And it's from the realization that he's perhaps not that super cool superhero that the second season and the final season are so loved by the fans, because it throws a bomb to both us and Araragi, leaving him alone sucking his thumb in a self-pity corner, as if he had finally come to the conclusion that, perhaps, trying to save people you only partially know from problems you definitely don't know, maybe, and I underline again, maybe, it's not always the right thing to do. Or is it? But I cannot continue to discuss the characters without also talking about the music, the setting and the direction, because it is thanks to them that an interesting story with brilliant characters turns into a masterpiece of Japanese animation. As I said before, Shaft took the characters' immediacy and injected this into every part of the anime to amplify its uniqueness, as if the soundtracks, the settings and the direction were pieces that complete what it is the character or the situation, maintaining at the same time such a quality that they can stand up on their own, even if removed from the context which they were designed. I mean, if you love to write fiction with background music like myself, then the Monogatari series soundtracks are all you need because they convey a certain feeling better than any other soundtrack. They pass from the jazz tones of Kizu Monogatari to the more experimental one of Baki Monogatari, but also from the carefree and cheerful tones of Nisi Monogatari to the most gloomy and melancholic ones of Owari Monogatari. The same can be said about the stunning, surreal settings that conquered my desktop since Baki Monogatari, and for the direction that makes every anime produced by Shaft iconic. It's as if all these elements are those beautiful and delicious sugar decoration on cakes. Except that, in this case, each decoration is a cake on its own, with other cakes instead of their sugar decorations. And I think there is no better way to prove this than trying to understand a character by looking at how he is shown and by listening to his soundtrack. And what better example than the character who not only is the most loved one, but it's also considered to be the absolute best girl of the Monogatari series? If there were any doubts, I'm talking about Kaiki Daishu. Just try to listen to his soundtrack without any visual reference and see what your head comes up with. The cello is overwhelming, so sharp that feels almost edgy. It's a melody that doesn't leave much room for imagination. It's dark and gloomy, and this is further emphasized by a piano that can barely be heard from how good it fits the atmosphere. The soundtrack conveys the insecurity of walking alone in the woods under a moonless night, where it's just you, your cell phone, the stars, and your it's definitely a mouse that thing in the grass, or the silhouette beyond the tree isn't a person, but branches with a strange shape. It's to recognize that there is something out there in the woods, but it's also to recognize that you will never be sure what that thing is. It's knowing nothing bad will happen. <laughs> well, for now, at least. Because that doesn't want to hurt you. It just wants to play with you. And when you'll return home, sure to have left that thing where it belongs, remember these words. Don't you dare turn on the lights, because only in this way he can see you. <laughs> But leaving aside all this mental image thing, what does this soundtrack tell us about Kaiki? Surely that he isn't a good person or someone that can be trusted, because the cello moves from one node to another with the same slow swaying of a snake. And what are snakes if not subtle predators? There is something very important to note. The soundtrack never comes to the point, there is no real payoff, so the soundtrack wants only to evoke the fear of a poisonous snake, even if its character isn't, because anyone can have a forked tongue, reptilian eyes and sharp teeth and pretend to be a snake, even if it's not. This soundtrack is called Ominous, a term that fits perfectly the melody, and the same can also be said for Kaiki's character design and for the environment in which he was placed.
this is the first time we meet him, and immediately all of his being conveys warning and tension, especially considering that he remains in the shadow for all his discussion with Araragi, as if he doesn't want to be identified. But looking beyond him, the first thing you will notice is the sky, which is literally on fire. It's colored with a very dark red, which also darkens all the environment because we are only a few minutes away from evening. And what is the evening or the shadows, if not a perfect cover for people with bad intentions? Speaking of shadows, it's impossible not to notice those distorted and obscure Lovecraftian tentacles directed towards Araragi projected from the dead trees behind Kaiki that conveys his bad intention towards our protagonist. And I'm sure those are dead trees because the events of Nisimonogatari, that is the narrative arc where this scene is taken, take place in the middle of the summer. And no tree loses its leaves in summer. Furthermore, this is another wordplay. After all, if Kaiki doesn't lie, his name can be written with the ideograms of dead tree. What a coincidence! Incidents, right? This is just one of the many examples of how the anime helps us understand who the new characters are long before Aragi says something, and when he does, we are right next to him to share his thoughts. But it's at this point that the Monogatari series draws up its secret weapon, because if for the entire duration of Nisei Monogatari Kaiki is shown as the bad guy, the next time we meet him is in Koi Monogatari, an artive arc in which he is both the protagonist and narrator, and these are how he's shown to us and his new soundtrack. Okay, where do I start? Well, Kaiki looks like a completely different character. Before he was this dark and ominous presence, while now appears like a strange adult, with a skin so cadaveric and with such funny and bizarre hairs that the more you look at him, the more he resembled Draco on the 1992 film. And the setting certainly doesn't help, the scene was overwhelmed by warm and dark shades, while now is literally a stunning and extravagant explosion of colors. Speaking about the soundtrack, the cell on the piano are still there, but now they are accompanied by an accordion, which occasionally takes the role of principal instrument. But despite the previous ominous, you can take this seriously, you can listen to this soundtrack without a funny smile on your face. It seems like the drunken version of Ominous. I mean, the accordion and the faster time transformed what was really an ominous melody into the Beagle Boys theme. It's like being in the same forest from before, with the same atmosphere, only with awareness that those noises are made by those assholes of your friends, who didn't have the decency to hide without being seen and without grinning as girls at the first pajama party. Imitation, the name of this soundtrack, is Omnius, which, like the environment and the characters, has been rearranged for a different story with a different protagonist. And this is a very important thing to keep in mind, actually. Because the protagonist of Nise Monogatari is Araragi, and Araragi hates Kaiki for what he did to Sinjogara and his sister Karen, so it's obvious that he's shown with such a dark soundtrack and a threatening setting. But is Kaiki really a bad guy, or is it Araragi who only met him in the worst way possible? These are the questions the Monogatari series ask you, using what might seem only odd stylistic choices, but in reality are a very powerful and subtle narrative mean, so sneaky that if you don't notice it, you won't realize that you are also being told part of the story. This is because the entire Monogatari series is told from the future, as if the protagonist is remembering an event happened months or years ago, and this is why many tend to underline how much the Monogatari series narrators are just a bunch of unreliable liars. After all, we can only tell what we remember of a past event, or rather, how we have experienced that event. And this makes a huge difference, narratively speaking. Even this video can be 100% the true truth about the Monogatari series, but only one truth, a truth filtered by a fan's good faith, who only wants to tell why he found this anime the best thing he's ever seen, also trying to explain why others may feel the same. The fact that we cannot escape from our subjectivism must also have been what Shaft thought when animating the whole series. Let's talk about the scene where Karen tells Araragi about her meeting with Kaiki. This is one of my favorite scenes ever because it does everything right. It just doesn't tell the fact as it is, but puts us in a 14 years old girl's shoes who wants to stop alone a scary man that has never met before, and she does so by filling her reconstruction with breathtaking rhetorical figures that represent her fear, when what really happens is Kaiki who touches her forehead and steals her money. In fact, we can say that every setting has that surreal feeling because it's never completely real, 
but a mixture of personal memories and interpretations. We have to thank entirely Shaftware this work, because it has taken the light novel's weakest points and turned them into these strengths, making static location with static character feel dynamic, colorful and full of kinetic actions. Because the Monogatari series, although considered by the Japanese almost like a real novel, remains a light novel, and consequently the descriptions, when there are some, seem written by an elemental child without imagination, and I mean these for all descriptions. If the Kubikiri cycle didn't have those character portraits at the beginning of each chapter, it would be impossible to have a clear idea of how they were physically designed, especially when there are three twins with only different eyes and hairs. Also, Nijo Izin can say how much you want that he doesn't describe environments because if the characters were true people, they would never describe where they are. But this doesn't make any fucking sense, also because it's only thanks to the wonderful anime adaptation if you can imagine a location when reading it on the light novel. And yes, this also applies to our beloved character designs. Wofan did an excellent job drawing those characters in the empty world they live in the light novels, but that have to be said also for Akio Watanabe, not to be confused with the other Watanabe, that gave those characters life and an actual characterization, thanks also to Nizioism himself, who gave him total stylistic freedom. And thanks God for that. I mean, Senjogar and Kambaru in the light novels have black hair or brown hairs. I, I simply can't imagine either without their violet hairs. Just like I can't imagine the anime with a different scenes composition. Shaft has shown incomparable smartness in animating a light novel because having almost a white canvas is easy, too easy to take interesting dialogues and setting them into a boring bar, just to shit a little more on that decomposed dead horse that is now sorted online. And not because there were no opportunities, all the light novels are based on characters standing still in one place talking for entire chapters. The first narrative arc of Owari Monogatari takes place entirely inside a classroom with only two characters, and Shaft manages to make what could easily have been the hour of flagellation into an intriguing visual experience, also managing to emphasize a very important part of Aragi characterization. Moreover, do you remember Senjogara's iconic opening scenes when she's falling from the stairs? All Shafts. In the light novel, that scene is written 14 pathetic lines at the end of the prologue, while in the anime it's so well directed that you can understand Araraki and Senjugara by simply looking at their movement and expressions. And I can't end this section without talking about those infamous monochrome screens, because they too are an important part of what makes the whole monogatari experience. They are used in many ways to insert some character thoughts written in the light novels, to outline new chapter beginning or as a non-elegant transition from one scene to another. But if you didn't know, their original purpose was to replace scenes that were not yet finished, and it's very likely that you didn't know, unless you have seen the original Bakemonogatari before the Blu-ray release. Shaft is historically understaffed, where not only the last three episodes were sold with the Blu-rays, but the entire action scenes were replaced by those monochrome screens. And, you know, I was one of those two people who didn't believe it until he saw it with his own eyes, and watching those scenes in the Blu-rays left me... very unsatisfied. Don't get me wrong, the action is great, but I believe that they don't have place in Bakemonogatari as the experimental anime that is. I say this not only because I think it's right to preserve the original versions, but also because they take away much of the mystery present in the original version. Hearing Araragi screaming and fighting those things is genuinely terrifying, as is seeing those screens with only red or black written on, because you can only imagine what's happening based on your interpretation of sounds. And isn't this interesting by itself? I thought the anime was so bold to make such a choice, while instead it was just an unfortunate event that many remember with extreme bitterness. But in defense of those screens, have you ever noticed that their color changed based on the scenes, dialogues or characters? Because they aren't random, but reflect the story's theme in some way. In fact, you can almost say that those monochromatic screens are the mirror of the whole series, a testament of something strange and unique, but also less excuse to not doing something better than can send away lots of people. Maybe they can spend less money for the openings and endings, which I have yet to see another anime doing so much work musically and visually speaking for something you probably skip every time, and use those money to make those thoughts in the actual show instead of writing them on screens because they, too, are full of passion, style and charisma. And isn't this the real important part? Recognize what works and what doesn't work, but nonetheless appreciate the passion behind it? Because we all want the perfect anime, we all want the most beautiful and emotional one, but this is impossible, also because flows make anything what it is, and they would never, never want to see a beautiful and shining monogatari series without all those pans, without all those monochromatic screens, or with a hundred more action scenes, because it wouldn't be my monogatari series anymore.
there are infinite words to describe the Monogatari series, and if my first is consistency, the second would certainly be home. Home is a word that has lots of meanings. For someone, home can only refer to a set of bricks and concrete, but for many others, it's anything which you want to return, something yours, something safe, just like the word family. And for me, and many others, the Monogatari series is both home and family. For this reason, to see the main storyline ending, for me, was witnessing the end of a long journey, a seven-year journey, where everything changed. I finished high school, I started a university course, and I also finished that university course. I started writing my first book, thanks to Bakemonogatari, and now I finished the third, thanks to him. People came, and people left. Like Araragi, Senjogara, Nadeko, Achikuji, and Kambaru, I lost challenges, I won challenges, and like them, I hope to become a more dynamic person. So that, one day, even I can hope to have a happy ending like Araragi. But the only thing that hasn't changed in this year is the deep love I feel for these stories, a love that is impossible to describe in words. And maybe that's why it's so hard to talk about it, because each of us love it in a different way and for different reasons. And I know that I must sound like a total lunatic at this point, but I really think that all the planets aligned for the making of this anime, that anything that could go well, went well. It's like, there was someone who said, hey, why don't we try mixing Nizio Isin's weird plots and character with the alienating shaft animation, and then throw in a lot of creativity, exceptional soundtracks, and a lot of style to create not a common anime, but a real work of passion? Because this is what it seems, nothing but pure passion, concentrated in a series that, when it ends, leaves a hole instead of the heart. Not because it's touching or anything, but simply because the main story ends without leaving nothing left to talk about. As if Nizio Isin was such a fan of his own works to know perfectly what we want from him. For example, even a pointless date with our favorite couple. There are thousands of ways to describe the Monogatari series. I could say that this is the story of a person called Araragi Koyomi, and in the end, they all lived happily even after, but it's not that. Because it's a story about boons, but not only. It's also a love story, a ghost story, a story about lies, a story about rebellion, and, above all, it's a story that tells how much fear the characters had to face to resolve their problems, but it's also the story on how they managed to succeed, overcoming their obstacles with courage and determination. It is a story that conveys the passion of its writer and creators, and also a story that is able to convey something no other anime is able to convey. And until the planets will realign again, until another anime will come out being able to thrill me with its strangeness, until then, I will be right here, watching Bakemonogatari and the whole Monogatari series for the 21st fucking time.